This final lecture is intended to guide you through your final exam essay on interreligious dialogue. I have several models of interreligious dialogue to introduce to you in the slides that follow, but first, it's important to take a little bit of an introduction note here on what we mean by the concept of interreligious dialogue. Because of all of the changes that we've had in both industry and technology, uh, certainly with the internet and other means of communication and then also uh, ways of travel, we see the world becoming a smaller and smaller place and people from very different backgrounds and people from very different places in the world are coming more and more, con in, more in more and more contact with one another. Here you see two very significant religious leaders uh, still living on the left is the 14th Dalai Lama of the Vajrayana uh, Buddhist tradition, that, that's t Tibetan Buddhism. And then we also have uh, the recent, uh, recently deceased uh, John Paul II, a very important and influential pope over the Roman Catholic Church. And so these two men, both champions of peace and justice and love, uh, meeting with one another on this occasion. Uh, when we have people from different religious backgrounds coming together, we certainly have some very important convictions that are coming into that conversation. And so when we look at models of interreligious dialogue, we're asking the question, what should happen in that dialogue? What should happen in that conversation between these two people from very different faith, very different religious backgrounds? And of course, there are many different answers to that question because people from different religious backgrounds will have many different purposes on what that meeting should involve. One of the first examples we have historically of when there is massive interaction between people of one religious group with people of another religious group came with the movement known as imperialism or more accurately colonialism. This took place when uh, Western European nations began to send out explorers into other areas of the world, uh, most uh, specifically India, the, sub, the subcontinent of India, also the continent of Africa and the continent of South America. Now, as these explorers entered into these areas, eventually military from the Western European nations and merchants from the Western European nations also made that migration. And the primary purpose of making this movement was uh, economic, the idea of being able to greatly increase financial wealth uh, on the backs of the indigenous people in these particular areas. But of course, religion eventually becomes involved and the primary uh, means or purpose we see in interreligious interaction and colonialism, because it certainly was not a dialogue, it was a one-way conversation, was that the supposed Christian colonialist try to force conversion upon the Indians, the Africans, and the South Americans. And uh, this is an attempt to have a more peaceful takeover of that particular area. But again, the primary purpose is certainly uh, one of greater economic gain. Uh, we see this uh, primarily in the 17th through 19th century with England, Spain, and France, and we've certainly had it in other parts of the world uh, with Muslim migration, but it has been Christians and Muslims who primarily embodied uh, this imperialistic or colonial, uh, colonialistic uh, spirit. The very uh, first modern day model that I'm going to introduce to you is called the conversionist model. You'll primarily find this among evangelical Christians and also conservative Muslims. And uh, this is the belief within a particular religion that that religion is the only path to salvation or the only path to enlightenment. And so the most important idea that takes place at the table of dialogue is that because you believe that your religion is the only path to salvation, you must try to convert the other person at the table of dialogue to your religion. Uh, only if that person converts can they be part of the saved group or part of the enlightened group. And if they are not converted, of course, they are uh, left out of that group of those who are considered the saved. Uh, you're about to see another model called the exclusivist model, and I want to make sure that you understand the difference between the exclusivist and the conversionist model. Uh, while conversionists do believe that only their religion or only their faith uh, is the path to salvation, we do have some conversionists that believe that there is some truth in other religions, just not enough for salvation, whereas the exclusivist model that we're about to look at does not believe that there is any truth at all in other religions. Okay, again, the exclusivist model says there is no truth in any other religion other than the religion that that person holds, and therefore absolute truth is found within that religion. 
Uh, we certainly see, again, primarily uh, Christians and Muslims, and uh, some of the most conservative Jewish people would also hold this view. Now, the exclusivist and the conversionist model do overlap somewhat, because some exclusivist uh, do think the uh, attempt to convert others is important, but there are other exclusivists that do not feel that the need to convert others is at all uh, really relevant to the conversation at, of interreligious dialogue. Many exclusivists are also what we would call universalist, and that means that they believe that all people will eventually be included in the path of salvation, whether they believe the one particular true religion or not, that that one true religion is so great that it will eventually uh, be universal salvation for all people. But as far as truth content is concerned, only that one religion, uh, whether that be a conservative form of Christianity, a conservative form of Islam, or a conservative form of Judaism, only that one religion provides uh, truth. But again, the one religion can be expansive enough to eventually include all people, whether they ever convert to that religion or faith or not. The primary model for interreligious dialogue within the Roman Catholic Church uh, changed dramatically during and after Vatican II. The older version of the Roman Catholic faith presented a view of uh, exclusivist uh, and in the in the claim that only those within the Roman Catholic Church uh, could be saved, and anyone outside of the Roman Catholic Church uh, would be damned. But again, major change during and after Vatican II, primarily tied to a very significant Catholic theologian of the 20th century named Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner began teaching a doctrine of anonymous Christianity, and this was the belief that there could be millions of Christians all over the world who've never even heard the name Jesus Christ, have never heard the stories of Jesus Christ, but they are anonymous Christians because their lives mirror Christ even without ever having heard the name or the story of Christ. And so therefore they are Christians without even knowing that they are Christians. And so this is a teaching that it's primarily the way that you live and how much your life looks like Christ is much more important than believing certain doctrines. Now, uh, we also see that John Paul II will come up with a more generous view of salvation that we've seen the Catholic uh, Church have in the past. John Paul II would talk about there being concentric circles of truth. And just so that you can uh, envision concentric circles, this is when you have a small circle in the middle and then a slightly larger circle outside of that and then an even larger circle outside of that. And John Paul II would say that within that innermost circle, that is the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, and that would be absolute truth. But then John Paul II, rather than excluding everyone else, would move it next to the, would move next out to that uh, next larger circle and say that within the Eastern Orthodox tradition and the Episcopal tradition, we see many similarities. So they're also included in the picture of salvation, even though they don't have as much truth as we do. And then John Paul II would even move out to Protestants after that. And then he would move out to Muslims and Jews after that, saying that there is a shared belief of monotheism within those faiths. And then uh, some would even argue that John Paul II would even move into some of the Eastern religions after that because there is a spiritual dimension within those religions of reaching out for ultimate reality. Uh, we also see that there are some very progressive to liberal Muslims, uh, mostly within the world of scholarship, who believe in something similar to anonymous Christianity, that the virtues of the Quran could be lived out by a person without them ever having heard of the Quran, and therefore they would be what you would call an anonymous Muslim, and also included in the picture of salvation. Our next model is that of, an, is of inclusivism, and inclusivists uh, try to avoid making judgments about other religious convictions, especially when it comes to uh, that that we have no real empirical access to, such as what an afterlife might be, uh, ultimate uh, uh, answers to questions about who is saved and who is not saved. Inclusivists are reluctant uh, to enter into those kind of conversations because they uh, humbly claim that that area is simply unknown. And so instead, let's say uh, you have a uh, Jewish inclusivist could sit down at the table uh, with a Buddhist, and the two of them would agree to talk about practical elements of life uh, in the world today, uh, such as uh, 
issues of social justice or some uh, ethical problems that their community is facing and how they could possibly uh, come to some, uh, again, practical answers to those problems. And so uh, here the example I gave you is a Buddhist and a Muslim. Uh, they would very much get into a debate if they were trying to force agreement on one another about the afterlife. But what they can do is look at some virtues that their traditions hold in common. Uh, certainly, uh, we see peace and submission are both uh, virtues uh, or convictions that are taught within these religions. And so these two could sit down together and try to see how those virtues can be lived out in the community to, to address particular social problems that they're facing. Because of the rise of agnosticism and atheism within Western culture, we certainly must have a place at the table for those who are the non-religious. And so what we have here is religious relativism. And uh, this is the position that's held by the a very vague theist, which would be perhaps an agnostic or a non-theist, uh, also could be called an atheist. And some of these individuals will believe that, you know, maybe uh, religion has some helpful elements to society, but uh, all religion is relative. It's not like you can prove one religion over another. But then there will be others that actually feel that religion does much harm and damage within society and would argue uh, that uh, religion needs to be done away with. Now, again, that would certainly be a very healthy debate at the table of dialogue, but I do not believe that religious people within any culture would have the right to disallow a place at the table for one who is agnostic or atheist. Uh, if that position is part of the community, then that person would need to be included at the table of dialogue. And so if you wish, when you get down to your final exam essay that you will be writing, I'll say more about that in just a moment, you certainly may choose to have an agnostic or, as, or an atheist as one of the people that you put at the table of dialogue. And our last two models are both forms of pluralism, but they're very different from one another. Uh, sometimes I refer to them as old school and new school pluralism, but the more proper term, academically speaking, would be that the older form of pluralism is called synthetic pluralism, and the newer form of pluralism is called phenomenological pluralism. If you've ever heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome, that will help you have an understanding of what synthetic pluralism means. This is the belief that all religions are basically teaching the same thing and that whatever the place of salvation or enlightenment is, that all religions are, are teaching the same virtues and the same convictions that will get all people uh, to that place of salvation. So it doesn't matter if you're a Christian. It doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim. It doesn't even matter if you're an agnostic uh, as a secular humanist, that all of those paths are religions or philosophies that will lead you to heaven or nirvana or whatever the place of salvation may ultimately be. Now today within uh, academics, this is considered a rather naive position to hold. And so we've seen most pluralists now shift to what is called the phenomenological approach. And this is the belief that the synthesis model was far too simplistic and that it does not understand the complicated differences and nuances and cultural impacts and uh, that all of these uh, have upon particular religions, uh, that the stories and doctrines are so unique within each faith tradition uh, that it really is simplifying things far too much to say, oh, they're all basically teaching the same thing, so the differences don't matter. A uh, phenomenological pluralist will say that we can make absolutely no judgment about a religion outside of our own, because the only way that you can truly know a religion well enough to make judgments about it is if you belong to that religion. And so a phenomenological pluralist holds the very humble stance that as a Jew, uh, he or she has no right to make any judgment on the Hindu community because he or she is not a part of that community and, and can never know it well enough. So pluralists say that you would actually have to convert to another faith or another religion to even begin to understand it in order to understand its value or lack of value. Uh, there are some similarities here to inclusivism and in that uh, the phenomenological pluralist as well as the synthetic pluralist uh, will have a very an inclusive picture of salvation. Many pluralists are often are universalist also, the belief that uh, all people uh, will eventually come into heaven or the, whatever the picture of salvation or enlightenment uh, may be named. Uh, one of my favorite authors uh, is a pluralist named Raimon or Raimundo Panikar. He has three PhDs, one in religion, one in philosophy, and one in chemistry. So he's quite a Renaissance man. 
and Panikkar was born to a Roman Catholic mother and a Hindu father. And so, one time in an interview he was asked, so do you consider yourself 50-50 because he practices in both of those communities? And he said, absolutely not. No one can be 50-50 when it comes to your faith. He says, I am 100% Catholic and I am 100% Hindu. So he considers himself to be very much a part of both of those communities, having been uh, reared in both of those communities. Okay, now let me walk you through the final exam. Again, you can find these instructions written in Blackboard. What you are going to do is to uh, produce a three-paragraph essay. In paragraph number one, you are going to create a character who comes from any particular religious background that you choose. Uh, you can name this character for me. You can describe him or her. And what I want to see is that uh, you go back to one of the religions that we've studied this semester. And as you present this character to me, you're going to describe to me uh, what his or her most important religious or faith convictions are. And then in the second paragraph, you're going to do the exact same thing with a second character. So let's say you create a Muslim character in the first paragraph. In the second paragraph, you may choose to create a Jain or a Sikh or uh, maybe someone who belongs to the Chinese religion of the Tao. It doesn't matter. You can choose any religion you want. But you create a second character and do the very same thing, describing what convictions are most important to that character. In the third paragraph, the last paragraph, you're going to place these two characters together at a fictional table and you're going to describe to me what that conversation or that dialogue looks like. Is uh, one of the individuals taking the conversionist model and trying to uh, debate and change the mind of the other person to go to, to his religion? Or is she there with a much more pluralist and maybe inclusivist attitude and she's trying to talk about more practical matters and, and not even address issues of afterlife or salvation? Or again, maybe you choose an agnostic or an atheist character that may be uh, very much having a negative view of religion and, uh, again, may have a militant tone or, or may have a tone that is much more cooperative. You can do whatever you want with these two characters. Now, I do have some students that come from a, a theater background, and if you wish, rather than doing this uh, final exam as an essay, you can write it out as a screenplay where we would actually have the name of the characters in the left margin and then you would actually spell out exactly how that dialogue uh, looks. So you can take either option you want on that. And uh, again, you have these instructions also on Blackboard. Uh, hope that it's been a worthwhile semester for you and I hope you all have a great summer. Goodbye.